So I think we'll begin. Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist here at the Maxwell Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center. I help coordinate all the programming here. Before we begin, please be aware that Mass Channel will be live streaming and recording this presentation for Mass Channel social media. Mass Channel staff are trained in patient safety and privacy. The staff will not interfere with the presentation in any way. If you're not comfortable asking your question out loud, feel free to write down your question on the card and I'd be happy to ask them for you. Today we have Dr. Jeff Yu. He is the director of the MGH Contact and Occupational Dermatitis Clinic at Mass General. He is also on the board of directors for the American Contact Dermatitis Society, as well as an active member of the Society of Pediatric Dermatology and Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance. And he is here to give a talk on allergic contact dermatitis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu. Well, thank you all of you guys for coming and um, anyone online watching this as well. Um, really hope that you guys can get something out of this presentation. Um, what I'm gonna talk about with you guys today is something called allergic contact dermatitis, something that we see a lot, but not everybody may be familiar with the specific terminology. Um, I run specialty clinic just in diagnosing patients with allergic contact dermatitis. We talk about what allergic contact dermatitis is, where it may be found, and how we go about diagnosing it. And I'm gonna walk you guys through this today. Um, just a list of some of my disclosures. I have no financial disclosures. I don't have any relationship with any of the companies that I'm gonna talk about here. I am gonna discuss non-FDA approved testing, which will come at the end and I'll explain what that is to you guys. Um, so some of the goals that we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna to talk about what allergic contact dermatitis is, where it's found, how you can get it, and why you get it. We're gonna demonstrate some of the most common allergens that we are going to see in your daily cabinet, in your daily life, and things that you come in contact with that you would just never even think about as containing potential allergens that can cause skin rashes on you. And then we're gonna show you how patch testing is done. We're gonna walk you through patch testing on Monday, we're gonna walk you through patch testing on Wednesday and Friday because it is a three-day event. Um, I'm gonna show many pictures. All of these are, can be found online. They're public images, they are on stock photos, they're all through Google Images. I'm gonna show you some published data because if I just do published data, everyone's gonna fall asleep. And then and none of the photos here are my patients. So how many of you guys' cabinet look like this? So this is a pretty typical medicine cabinet in your bathroom, right? We're looking at different products on top, for example, such as different types of sunscreens, different types of hairsprays, different types of shampoos, deodorants, such and such. And just to kind of go through some of the products we use, and I go through this with all of my patients, all right? So here you have um, a female patient and some of the things that they use typically, shampoos, conditioner, detangler, hairspray, hair gel, mousse, hair dye, highlights, lowlights. These are terms I learned after I started doing this because prior to this, I do none of this stuff, right? <laughs> Shampoo my hair, that's the end of it. What about cosmetic products? So we move from the hair to the face. What are we looking at now? Eyeshadow, eyeliner, mascara, eye serum, night cream, sunscreen, whatever it is, all of these products can potentially contain allergens that can cause itchy rashes on your skin. Now we move a little bit further down the body body washes, body soaps, body spray, perfume, wax, shaving gel. Think about the number of things that we come in contact with every single day in our life, but we never really think too much about what is in them. We just think maybe it's organic, maybe it's from Whole Foods, maybe it's a little bit more expensive, therefore it must be good for us. And this is what guys usually use, a five-in-one shampoo, conditioner, body wash, face wash, and pre-shave. So guys, a little bit easier in terms of evaluation for things that they potentially can come in contact with just because they use very few items. I had a guy yesterday that uses whatever he uses to wash dishes with, he uses that in his hair too, because he's like, I can wash dishes with it, it must be good for my hair as well. Versus you're probably never gonna hear a female patient say that. <laughs> So allergic contact dermatitis, by definition, is an itchy rash that comes from something that comes in contact with your skin directly. So we're talking about personal care products, we're talking about clothing, we're talking about jewelry, we're not talking about certain foods that you eat, we're not talking about lemons, we're not talking about peanuts, we're not talking about pollen outside, and we're not talking about dust, we're not talking about mold, unless you're rubbing that directly on your skin. But we're talking about things that your skin directly comes in contact with. So this is the most typical example of allergic contact dermatitis that most of us are going to be familiar with. Imagine if you're hiking out in the woods. This lady's doing a great job with sun protection with a wide brim hat, which I approve. Um, however, looking at her legs and looking at her arms, she has a lot of exposed surfaces here. What can you come in contact with when you're outside? Especially when you're hiking in the woods, especially this type of area. Anybody? 
you guess. Poison ivy. Poison ivy, perfect. Exactly, poison ivy and various other types of plants. So here you come in contact with poison ivy, and then 24 and 72 hours later, what happens to your skin? You get a rash. And this is allergic contact dermatitis. You come in contact with it, and then over a short period of time, you get an itchy rash that shows up on your skin. Why does it take 24 to 48 hours? This is one of the very few basic science slides, I, I promise. But what this type of allergic reaction is, is something called a type four allergic reaction. There are four different types primarily. Delay type, um, allergic contact dermatitis is a delay type hypersensitivity. It takes a little bit of time to appear. And it takes on average 24 to 72 hours. This is gonna play a role later when I talk about why we do the testing and why it takes about a week because of the same exact reason. So what happens over here? So if you look at the left side of the slide, those little triangle things are substances in your environment that you come in contact with. There are cells that look like the green blob. Those cells are gonna pick up on these and they're gonna to move to a lymph node where you have all these white blood cells sitting there waiting to learn something new. Those, blo those green blobs or those cells take, take the um, allergen, move it to your lymph node, teaches, what, teaches those cells what this allergen is, and then you develop an allergic reaction. This doesn't happen in everybody. This happens in some people and doesn't happen in others. We don't really know why yet. And then the second time you come in contact with it, on the right-hand side, you see the reaction slide. You come in contact with the same exact potential allergen. Your body already knows what it is, and this time it can actually develop a reaction. However, this doesn't happen immediately. This takes about 24 to 72 hours to appear. You go hiking today, you come in contact with poison ivy today, you're not gonna get a rash today. It might take tomorrow or the day after before you really start to pop up with this rash because it takes time for your body to create this type of reaction. Typical treatment for allergic contact dermatitis, some sort of a topical immunosuppressive medication, topical steroids, including things like hydrocortisone that you can get over the counter, are great treatments for allergic contact dermatitis, but we have to be careful with how we use this. Contact dermatitis is not the same thing as food allergy usually, because things that you come in contact with are very different than the things that you are eating. Often, but not always, and that's a different topic. However, usually food allergy causes a different type of reaction than contact dermatitis, and I'll show you what food allergy causes. So here you have a child who eats a peanut butter sandwich. What if he's allergic to peanuts? What happens in 15 to 30 minutes? So we're not talking 24 to 72 hours anymore. We're talking a relatively short period of time. He doesn't become Will Smith, but he can look like what Will Smith looks like here, where you get swollen lips, swollen eyes, and a hive-like reaction relatively quickly. This is very different from allergic contact dermatitis, right? Allergic contact dermatitis, you get an itchy skin rash. Food allergies, you potentially can have difficulty breathing, sw swelling of the eyes, eyes can become swelled shut, runny nose, itchy mouth, swollen lips, hives that break out all over, and it happens relatively quickly. Two very different types of reactions, okay? How does this happen? So food allergies, pollen is included in this, bee stings is also included in this, these are called type one allergic reactions. So allergic contact dermatitis is type four. This is a type one reaction. What happens in a type one reaction? These little, green, um, these little yellow blobs are essentially the allergen itself. They bind to this um, purple blob called a mast cell. When it binds to the mast cell, the mast cells are gonna release these little purple granular substances. Those things are called histamines. So your body releases histamines and this can happen very, very quickly. So what do you take to help with this? you take some sort of an antihistamine. Antihistamines do not work well for allergic contact dermatitis because it's not driven by histamines. Antihistamines work really well for seasonal allergies, food allergies, pollen allergies, all the kind of things that, we, that have this type of reaction where you get hives, where you get reactions where you get swelling of the eyes, swelling of the lips, swelling of the mouth, and things like that. But certainly, if any of these patients have difficulty breathing, you shouldn't really be relying on this. You should really find, the, um, you should really find your nearest hospital. But allergic contact dermatitis does not tend to cause these kind of systemic symptoms where you may have difficulty breathing, type one reactions, food, pollen, bee stings, things like that can, all right? So two very different types of reactions. This is really the last I'm gonna talk about type one allergic reactions, but this is just to compare and contrast the two different ones. So the American Academy of Dermatology is kind of the governing body for most of the dermatologists in this country, and they release these numbers every so often called the burden of skin disease. So just to get the public and the government to realize what kind of burden skin diseases actually have on the American population. So contact dermatitis by the numbers. So you can see that contact dermatitis can develop across all ages. 
you can see 0 to 17 on the bottom, 33.5% of the people can have contact dermatitis. If you're 65 and up, 20% have contact dermatitis. I don't think this graph really shows the accurate um, depiction of what the prevalence is because we see this across all ages and certainly we don't see it more often in children compared to adults. We can really see it at any time. I have some patients come to me and they're like, I'm 70 years old. I have used the same perfume for the last 20 years of my life. How can I be allergic to this perfume today versus I wasn't allergic to it 20 years ago? We don't fully understand that yet, but what we do realize is that people can use the same thing and you can get a new allergic reaction at any point. It's just when your body decides to one day become allergic to something. There are certain triggers we think about, but when you develop an allergic reaction has no bearing on your body, has no bearing on your immune system, has no bearing on what the product itself is. It can really happen at any time. I see allergic contact dermatitis in three month olds to diaper wipes. I see allergic contact dermatitis to 90 year olds to their clothing. More on that later. But this can happen at any time during your life. There is also a significant cost um, associated with allergic contact dermatitis. Certainly not just poison ivy, but people can become allergic to things that you work with, things that you come in contact with. Just the other day, I had a patient who works in heating and cooling for HVAC systems, and he's having a horrendous hand and feet rash. We're gonna try to see if we can figure out if it's something he comes in contact with or not. He's been working in that industry for 25 years. Why did it just start? Nobody knows, all right? So you can see that contact dermatitis cost about $699 million in the course of a year in terms of lost productivity for people who are working. So this is a significant issue that um, we are trying to figure out and we are trying to battle. So what are some of the most common things that people can become allergic to? And, the, and this data is published every other year by the North American Contact Dermatitis Group. So the top 10 contact allergens in 2015 to 2016, and this is the most recent number, I've color coded some of them to kind of group them together a little bit on the next few slides. But number one is nickel, and I'll talk about that. And then the percentage of people who were patch tested, meaning people who were referred to clinic and were evaluated for a suspicious rash, got patch testing and 17.4% were allergic. What that means is one in five people who have some sort of an itchy rash are allergic to nickel. And then the numbers kind of fall a little bit from there, but you can see what the top 10 are, and I'm gonna go through these in the next several slides. So the first one I'm going to talk about is number one, which is nickel, and number nine, which is cobalt. The reason why I'm grouping them together is because they are both metals. Nickel, for example, is a very common metal that is used across the board in everything. So for example, this tripod that you're holding, that probably has nickel in it. Earrings that are bought from Claire's or earrings from Piercing Pagoda or anywhere that is a little bit cheaper is going to have nickel. Anything that is white and shiny or silvery and shiny that is not made out of silver or white gold probably contains some degree of nickel. Your clipboard, your keys, your coins, they contain nickel as well. As you can see, nickel is kind of ubiquitous across the board because it's cheap and because it's durable and people use it in a lot of different things. People have nickel in their glasses, old cell phones, such as the Motorola Ra Razor that we used about a decade ago, that also contained a lot of nickel and people had allergic reactions to that. You can see about one in five people are allergic to nickel. Cobalt is often found with nickel. So cobalt and nickel are often used together to produce jewelry and to produce various metallic objects. Cobalt is used a little bit less and therefore the prevalence of cobalt allergy is a little bit lower as well. But certainly cobalt still makes a top 10 almost on every single list across the world. Where are you gonna find these two metals? Buck belt buckles, for example, jean snaps, jewelry, keys, locks, anything that is silvery, anything that is shiny, anything that is hard and metallic probably contains one of these metals. When do you become sensitized to nickel? Right around this age. So when people start getting piercings, especially when you're piercing with something that is not made out of gold, titanium, silver, or one of those other precious metals, if it's made out of a cheaper metal, such as nickel, there is a good chance of sensitization. They've done studies in Europe where they've taken kids who were um, pierced at a very early age versus pierced at a later age, specifically at a later age after they've had dental work, there's a significant difference in terms of nickel allergy. Kids who were pierced at an earlier age before dental work had a very high nickel allergy rate, similar to what we have here, versus kids who were pierced at a later age after they've gotten dental metals already, crowns, fillings, whatever it may be that may contain nickel, their rate of nickel sensitivity is actually significantly lower. It's talking a little bit about oral tolerance here, but again, different topic. Nickel allergy happens very early on. What does nickel allergy look like? On the very left hand side, someone's allergic to their belt buckle. You can see that there's a little bit of rash under the belly button, very common location to get a nickel related rash. Person in the middle has a rash right around the earrings and the earlobe, super common location. A lot of patients will tell me, I could never tolerate cheaper jewelry before. I always got infected. 
Just because it's red and itchy doesn't mean it's infected. Sometimes it's truly an allergic reaction, and that's what an allergic reaction looks like. On the, um, on the right hand side, this is the underbelly of a watch. Sometimes you can get a reaction to the nickel side of a watch as well, especially on the wrist. Very common to see that too, okay? Now, how do we detect nickel? There's actually this cool little kit called a nickel alert detect. And what that is is a solution that you dump onto a little bit of a Q-tip. And you take that Q-tip and you swab a shiny, oops, and you swab a shiny metal object with it. And if it turns pink, it contains enough nickel to cause an allergic reaction. So for my patients who have nickel allergy, I always tell them where to buy this. They get this, they figure out what has nickel on there. They avoid nickel, they can get a lot better. I had a patient who was a hairdresser, horrible hand dermatitis, did it for about five years. Patch tested her, she was very allergic to nickel. All her instruments that she uses, scissors, whatever, all had nickel in it. Swiss to stainless steel, which contains nickel, but it doesn't get released onto the skin to cause a reaction. Her, her hands completely cleared and she was able to continue working as a hairdresser. So this is not just in personal use stuff, this is also in occupational exposures as well. All right. So what can we do about nickel allergy? So nickel allergy is actually becoming a very hot political topic. In Europe, they have an easier time passing legislation than we do in the States. However, it's something called the EU Directive or the European Union Directive, they've actually started to limit the amount of nickel used in jewelry. So the amount of nickel has to come down for their jewelry to be able to be sold in retail stores. What they found, they implemented the EU directive and each of those bars looked at different age groups and you can see the prevalence of nickel allergy really started to fall after they started to limit the amount of nickel exposure. Because if your exposure to nickel is less, the chances of you being sensitized to nickel is lower and therefore you may not develop an allergic reaction to nickel going forward. So nickel legislation is very important. All right, we're gonna move on to the next topic here. So we talked about nickel and cobalt, we're gonna move on to some preservatives. So number two on the list of most common allergens is something called methyl isothiazolinone. It is a mouthful, so we abbreviated MI. 13.4% of the people are allergic to MI. 10 years ago, you wouldn't have heard about MI allergy, but recently MI allergy has really skyrocketed because a lot of consumer products have chosen to use MI as a preservative instead of some of the other ones that might have fallen out of vogue, and I'll talk about some of them too. Where are you gonna find MI? You can find MI in personal care products on the left. This is just an aisle at a generic um, drugstore. You can find MI in glues, very commonly used in school glues, very commonly used on the hands of children. And then you can find MI in different house paints as well. There are plenty of cases of people who are allergic to this substance. They developed a face rash when they started remodeling their home or painting their home because the MI in the paint in the walls can be released onto the air and then those air particles can fall onto your face and they can cause a rash there. So the picture on the left is actually someone who developed a MI allergy because of paint. So you can see you can get a full face rash. The picture in the middle is actually a case series of six children who developed a really awful rash around the mouth because of MI that was contained in diaper wipes. Pampers diaper wipes, Huggies diaper wipes, some diaper wipes from previous, from before. They don't do this anymore, but from before used to contain MI. Kids would be allergic to it. Parents would use it to wipe their mouth after they eat because some of these kids are a little bit, you know, can have a little bit of food left over around their mouth. Wipe their mouth, cause quite a bit of a rash. Couldn't figure out what it was due to. Once they remove the diaper wipes and a little bit of treatment, you can see on the bottom photo, their mouth completely cleared up. After this came out, it caused an uproar in amongst parents, amongst the industry as well. And then since then, MI is actually not using any more diaper wipes. So having reports like this is actually really helpful in informing the industry. And then finally on the right hand side, this is a little, um, this is a patient who had really bad hand dermatitis and eventually they figured out that it was actually due to slime. Have you guys heard of slime before? So slime is something that kids are now making. Um, it's actually becoming the number one Google trend of 2017, meaning kids are looking into what slime is. Kids are looking up videos of how to make it. There were billions of views of YouTube videos on how do I make slime at home? Common slime components, hair shampoos, dishwashing detergents, Glues, all of those things potentially contain MI, and a lot of kids are allergic to MI from exposure to homemade slime. This is the trend of MI allergy, as you can see, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, relatively stable. And then something happened around 2008, 2009, when everybody started to use this in personal care products, the rate of MI allergy started to skyrocket. So the more we use a particular product that's potentially allergenic, the more likely people are to develop allergens. That makes sense, right? If we remove this from products, people are not really gonna be allergic to it anymore. The more we use it, the more people are going to be allergic. 
Where else are we gonna find MI? As you can see, there are certain websites out there that you can find what's actually in certain products. So goodguide.com is something that we will sometimes use. Mrs. Myers, people love Mrs. Myers. Like, oh yeah, it's sold at Whole Foods, it's really nice. This is a Mrs. Myers all-purpose cleanser. It's second from the bottom, you can see methyl isothiazolinone is listed as an ingredient. So just because something is more expensive, just because something is sold at a store that you think may be more holistic, maybe more um, natural, maybe more organic, doesn't mean it's always safer. Tea tree, um, this is a tea tree brand shampoo by Paul Mitchell. You can see that um, fourth from the bottom, you can see that MI is also listed as an ingredient there as well. So again, people who are allergic to this will and may react to these products. So always look at the ingredients. You'd be surprised at what you find. I'm gonna talk about fragrances. So fragrances dominate three of the top 10 most common allergens um, that's published, and this has been going on for years now. We test the several different types of fragrances, specifically in mixes. We test the something called Fragrance Mix 1, which contains eight of the most common fragrances that people may be allergic to. We test the Fragrance Mix 2 on the bottom, which is the, six, the next six most common fragrances. And then we test the something called Balsam of Peru. Balsam of Peru is actually a sap that comes from a tree. It's actually not from Peru at all. It's actually from Central America. However, the balsam of that tree contains a mixture of many different types of fragrances that people can be allergic to. So we find that by testing to it, it's a good marker whether or not a patient has fragrance allergy. So we'll test these three markers. As you can see, significant rates of allergic contact dermatitis, anywhere from one in 20 to one in 10 people may be allergic to fragrances. Again, these numbers are from patients who are referred to these clinics for patch testing. So general population, probably lower. If you have an itchy rash, probably a little bit higher. So where are you gonna find fragrances? Most common places, right? You're thinking perfumes, you're thinking different types of body sprays, you're thinking things that make you smell nice, colognes, whatnot, common places to find fragrances. However, you can find fragrances really everywhere. Scented candles, something that people don't often think about. The reason why it has this scented candle because it releases fragrances. If you can smell it, the fragrance chemicals are floating around in the air, potentially can land on your skin and cause you to break out in a rash. Different types of shampoos and conditioners. When they did a study a few years ago on shampoos and conditioners, over 80% of all shampoos and conditioners contain some sort of fragrances because it has to smell nice, right? Herbal essences definitely contains fragrances. Pantene Pro-V definitely contains fragrances. You have to find specific fragrance-free shampoos and conditioners for it to not contain fragrances. You can look at different kind of face creams. Holistic Apothecary Rose Water contains fragrances, right? It smells like roses probably. Makeup removers often contain fragrances as well. This one here from Target is Evening Calm, probably contains some sort of fragrances in there. Draft, so a lot of parents are like, oh, I use Draft for my laundry detergent because it says here, look at it, it's stage one for newborns, so it must be really gentle, right? Problem with Draft is that they try to create fragrances that smell like newborns, so it smells really nice, therefore it has a lot of fragrances in it. Not infrequently do we see adults and children develop allergic contact dermatitis to fragrances in detergent. Other places that's now really all the rage for fragrance allergy, essential oils. Essential oils are all fragrances. That's all it is. They take some sort of a flower or they take some sort of a plant that has a really nice smell to it. They distill it, they take the oils and bottle it. And then people will put it into different kind of diffusers so it can kind of release this nice smell throughout the room, whether it's calming because it's lavender, whether it has chamomile, whatnot, you can definitely develop an allergic rash to this. I had a patient who makes her own soaps. So she takes a lot of essential oils, makes the soaps herself, comes in with a five year history of a really bad hand rash to the point where she can't close her fist. She can't close her hands and make a fist because of how cracked her hands were. We tested her to all her essential oils that she brought in. So she brought in this basket full of essential oils that she uses. We tested her to a bunch of them. She was probably allergic to at least 50% of them. Lemon oil, tea tree oil, frankincense, things I didn't even know were actual essential oils. She had a reaction to them. Once you removed all of it, her hands completely cleared up. So essential oils are very potent causes of allergic contact dermatitis, especially to fragrances. So we always ask about this, okay? There are a lot of period marketing schemes nowadays for essential oils. People love buying essential oils at various different food shops. People will use essential oils to treat eczema, which is not always a great idea because in eczema, your skin barrier is already a little bit broken. When you put essential oils or a potent allergen on a already broken skin barrier, you just make it more likely for them to develop a skin reaction. They've done some studies on essential oils. You can see here, this is a um, study on essential oils out of North America and Central Europe. They tested people to different fragrance mixes. You can see the prevalence of allergy there, but they also tested to essential oils on the bottom in the red box, and you can see that Elaine Lane oil, 1% of the people they tested were allergic to that. Jasmine, 0.66% of the people they tested were allergic to that. 
peppermint, tea tree oil, lavender, people have positive reactions to these essential oils. So it can definitely occur even in the setting of a negative fragrance allergy, you can be allergic to the oil itself. Where does fragrance allergy show up? Eyelids, most commonly. Why do you think eyelids? Anyone wanna guess? So when you have fragrances in the air, it can land all over your skin, right? Eyelids, anywhere on your body, is the thinnest skin on your entire face. So eyelids is the number one place for people to develop a fragrance allergy or any sort of allergy that their face comes in contact with. You can get fragrance allergy on the hands, the story about the person who makes soap. You can get fragrance allergy on the armpits, most likely due to deodorants. And then you can get fragrance allergies really anywhere, neck, chest, anywhere that people are likely to spray fragrances. Common places to get an allergy to that as well. I see people with fragrance allergy all over their body, from Tide, from different types of detergents, from um, founts, um, dryer sheets, anything like that can potentially cause a fragrance-related allergy. I'm talking about formaldehyde. So some of you may be wondering, why is formaldehyde used in our products, right? We think about formaldehyde, we think about it using to preserve specimens, we think about it as a carcinogen. You're absolutely correct in all of these things. Formaldehyde has been shown to cause cancer. Formaldehyde can certainly cause irritation as well. But formaldehyde also works as a great preservative. And I'll tell you why it's used as a preservative in a bit. So formaldehyde, it's not really nice to put formaldehyde on a product label. You look at a label, it says formaldehyde. Most of you guys are probably gonna put it back. However, cosmetic, country, cosmetic um, companies got really intelligent. What they came up with was a group of um, molecules called formaldehyde releasers. So it's not formaldehyde itself, it's a group of molecules that's listed over here that will release small amounts of formaldehyde into the product itself over the number of years of shelf life that the product is supposed to sit there. So if you went out and bought Head & Shoulders, chances are that didn't get made yesterday. It probably got made years ago. Mm -hmm. And it got made years ago, was sitting in the back of some truck, maybe came on a shipping container somewhere, and then made it into the, store, um, into the storeroom, and then finally made it onto the shelves where it's gonna sit for a few more months before you choose to buy it and take it home. When you buy it and take it home, where are you putting it? In storage. Put it in, well, in storage, or you can put it in the shower, right? Mm -hmm. The shower is a hot, it's a moist environment. What happens to things in hot, moist environments? It's gonna grow something. So, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So other places you're gonna find formaldehyde, shampoos, conditioners, body washes, right? Hair gels, night creams, anywhere you can find some sort of a formaldehyde releasing agent to preserve it, to prevent it from growing mold, to prevent it from growing bacteria, to prevent it from growing viruses, because those things are dangerous to you as well. Can you imagine rubbing mold all over your skin or dispensing mold from a detergent when you're putting it on your hair and you're trying to wash it? That actually causes severe human harm. So my perfect example for this is when I, well, this is how I tell patients why there are preservatives in your products. Go, on, go to Whole Foods and you buy a loaf of bread. You take it and you put it in your shower. What's gonna happen to that loaf of bread maybe within 24 hours? It's gonna look like this, right? But you don't want your personal products looking like that. You don't want your detergent, you don't want your shampoo, you don't want your, you don't want your face cream that you're gonna keep in the bathroom, you don't want your hair gel looking like this. But why wouldn't it look like this if you're keeping it in a location that is 99 plus percent humidity, you take a shower and the temperature is probably in the 80s or 90s, why wouldn't it look like this? It's because of all the preservatives they put in there, but they have to. They have to put preservatives in there to prevent it from growing mold and causing human harm. The question is, how can we find preservatives that don't cause allergic contact dermatitis? And people are still trying to figure that out. But this is why formaldehyde is in products, okay? Formaldehyde is also in clothing, all right? And formaldehyde is in clothing because when you buy clothing that is non-iron, when you buy clothing that is permanent press, what do they put into the clothing to make it that way? And a lot of them are formaldehyde-derived resins. So people who are allergic to formaldehyde are also, can also be allergic to their clothing. When you go out and buy a button-down shirt, you wanna throw it in the dryer, you don't wanna iron it afterwards, you wanna take it out and it looks crisp and clean, it's because it has formaldehyde resins in it in order for it to do that. You take your sheets that are permanent press, you throw it in the dryer, you take it out, and it's ready to put back on your bed and it looks crisp like you don't have to iron it, it's because it has formaldehyde in that as well. A lot of these clothing products have formaldehyde in it. Permanent press, wrinkle resistant, non-iron shirts, definitely has some sort of a resin. There are low formaldehyde resins because they are more expensive. They're actually less used in the clothing industry. Most popular are going to be some of your formaldehyde derived resins, okay? People can develop allergic contact dermatitis from formaldehyde resins um, in clothing. This is one where per permanent press allergy in active service military because in the military you want your crisp 
You want your clothing to be looking crisp. You want it to be wear resistant. You want it to be tough. You want to take it out. You want it to look nice. Permanent press, wrinkle resistant, wrinkle free, whatever you want to call it, has formaldehyde in it. People can definitely become allergic to it. These are published case reports of people who are allergic to the formaldehyde in their clothing, and we certainly see this um, not uncommonly. All right, so something relatively easy. Number six and number seven on the list, always, is neomycin as well as bacitracin. These are two common over-the-counter antibiotics that people use. So, so neosporin on the left is a triple antibiotic. You can see the ingredients, bacitracin, neomycin, and polymyxin. People use bacitracin and neomycin together a lot in different types of topical um, antibiotics. Where do you tend to put this? Not on normal skin, but on skin that's already a little bit damaged, right? So you're really increasing the likelihood that people are going to develop allergic reactions to these. These are heavily marketed. You can see Neosporin, number one doctor recommended brand. I don't really know if that's true, but certainly we in dermatology never recommend Neosporin because we know that 7% of people can develop an allergic reaction to Neosporin. Oftentimes we'll have a skin procedure done. They'll go home and put Neosporin on there. We'll get a call in about 48 hours that says now I have a new skin infection. If you don't have a skin infection, you have an allergic contact dermatitis to Neosporin. And certainly we don't want to complicate the two because then we're talking about unnecessary oral antibiotics and things like that as well, driving up healthcare costs and as well as patient morbidity. Bacitracin is also a first aid antibiotic ointment that can often be found. You can see bacitracin is number seven on the list, not far below Neosporin. Neomycin in terms of causing allergic contact dermatitis. These are by far the most common topical medications to cause allergic contact dermatitis in the United States. Right, so people can develop simultaneous allergies to all of these things. This is someone who developed a periocular um, dermatitis to, neo, to neomycin that was used in eye drops after an eye surgery, and you can see what it looks like. Certainly if someone comes in like that, your number one question is, do you have an infection from the surgery? But it's actually an allergic reaction to the different types of drops that they're using. All right, and then the final top 10 allergen we're gonna talk about here is something called paraphenylene diamine, abbreviated as PPD. Most of you will recognize this in hair dyes. I just had someone who was very allergic to their hair dye. Men actually can sometimes dye their beards. They were very allergic to the hair dye um, that they were using for their beard, developed a huge reaction on their face. You can get allergic contact dermatitis to hair dye in women as well, no matter what the color. You can see it in brown, you can see it in red, you can see it in maroon, you can see it in dark blonde. Different colors will contain PPD2, is the most common hair dye allergen. And then the photo on the right, anybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. That's henna tattooing. So henna, what color should henna be? Brown. Exactly, kind of a reddish brown. But when you see a lot of henna tattoo, it actually looks black. Why does it look black? They put PPD in there to make it look black. So I'll show you some of the reactions that people can get from henna tattoos. <laughs> so that's a reaction from hair dye on the bottom left. So someone got hair dye, they can get a pretty drastic reaction. In PPD reactions, it can sometimes look like a type one reaction. Remember the one with the food allergy we talked about? Some people with PPD reactions can actually get significant swelling on their face. Neck dermatitis, not uncommon from hair dyeing, just because the hair kind of lays down your neck. You can also get scalp redness too from the hair dyes that people use. Some of my patients will tell me, I never thought I had an issue. I go to the hair salon, it stings for a little bit for the next day or two, but afterwards things feel a little bit better. They have a PPD allergy, just undiagnosed. This is what can happen with henna tattoos. So on the picture on the left, you can see that um, this boy got a dragon henna tattoo and some sort of a claw henna tattoo. That's what happened to the claw henna tattoo after a period of 24 to 48 hours. Significant PPD allergy here. And then this is a henna tattoo gone wrong. You, this person had henna tattooing all the way up and down her arms for an Indian wedding. And then afterwards, you can see that the blistering reaction from a strong PPD allergy. This is what PPD allergy and henna tattoo looks like, okay? PPD is not really used in the other types of tattooing very commonly, probably is um, in some sorts of tattoos, but most commonly we're talking about henna tattoos, we're talking about PPD allergy. All right, so how do we test for this, okay? So this is the last segment here. How do we test for allergic contact dermatitis? We do something called patch testing in our clinic, and patch testing is not what we typically think about with prick testing. When I ask my patients, have you had allergy testing before? Almost all of them will say yes, because by the time they've made it to me, they've had some sort of testing. Nine out of 10 talk about this type of testing. What, what is this type of testing here? This is prick testing, where if you go to the allergist, they're gonna put a little drop of something you may be allergic to, whether it is cat dander, whether it is pollen, whether it is birch, whether it is food, some sort of food. They take a little stylus and they scratch your skin and they see if you get a hive-like reaction or not. That test for food allergies, that test for pollen allergy, that test for type one hypersensitivity, the one where histamine is released. On the left, we're testing for type four or delayed type hypersensitivity, which is patch testing. And I'll show you how the patch testing works. 
So in order to find someone who do patch testing, there's a great website. Um, it is called the American Contact Dermatitis Society. Again, I am conflicted because I am sitting on the board of directors for this for this um, society. However, this is the only so similar. So this is the only society for patch testing in the United States. We're the largest society here. We encompass dermatologists as well as allergists who are proficient in patch testing and can do patch testing in the clinics. There's a very useful find a provider function if you think you may have allergic contact dermatitis going to this website and then going to find a provider near you may be the best way for you to get evaluated appropriately. Um, here at Mass General, we do have a contact dermatitis and occupational dermatology clinic where we look at patients who, do, who may be allergic to something they're exposed to at work or something they're exposed to at home, and we do do patch testing here for patients. We evaluate roughly four to 500 patients per year. So there are different types of patch testing that can be done, and I kind of break them down into different levels of patch testing. There is basic patch testing, which we use something called the true test. True test looks at 35 different allergens. That's it, 35 different allergens, comes pre-packaged, easy to use. So most community providers will have true testing, most non-patch testers will have some sort of true testing available. They stick 35 allergens on your back, take a look and see if something is positive. Problem with true testing, they've done evaluations on this, you'll miss about 40% of relevant positive reactions, okay? You're gonna find some of the most common ones, but you're gonna miss about 40% of them in people who may have a rash. So just because you're negative to true testing doesn't mean that you don't have an allergic contact dermatitis. The next level is something called the intermediate level. So there's intermediate level patch testing where they use a slightly more comprehensive panel. There are different panels that are published by different societies, and the standard panel is about 80 allergens. So we're putting 80 different things on your back. Much better in terms of detection rate, much better in terms of the likelihood of finding something that is a relevant positive. However, when they've done studies, you're still missing about 20% of positive reactions. Most of them tend to be occupational, meaning things that the general public probably doesn't come in contact with unless you are working in very specific fields, for example dental technicians, hairdressers, you know, oil and um, fluid workers who work on cars, things like that. They can be exposed to a very special set of things that we don't need to test the general public to because why test you to it since you never come in contact with it. Finally, we do something called the advanced testing. Advanced testing is where you take the core allergens of 80 things and then we add things onto it, specialty panels and personal products. So what I'll do is I'll actually have you come in and bring everything you're currently using and then I'll test you to what you're using to see if we can get an allergic reaction out of that. That way we can know if you're allergic to your shampoo, your conditioner, your hair gel, and whatnot, so we can really target it towards you. This is the only kind of testing that we're doing here, and we often test to about 150 or more allergens. So we're kind of really taking this large battery of allergens, putting it on your back, and seeing what kind of allergic reaction you may or may not develop. So this is a three-day evaluation. When I tell patients for patch testing, it takes about a week to do, all right? The reason why it takes about a week to do, as from one of the initial slides that you guys saw, it takes about 24, 48, or even 72 hours for a reaction to occur. It doesn't happen immediately, so we need you to come back three days that week, and it takes about a week for us to do, it, do this appropriately. So what happens here is my nurse will take those syringes. Each of those syringes contain different types of allergens. She'll dispense a little bit of that syringe into each one of those little white dots over there. All those white dots will eventually make their way onto your back. So depending on what we're testing you for, we can test you to 80 things, we can test you to 200 different things, depending on what our suspicion is that you are allergic to. So this happens on Monday, and when you go home, you're gonna look like this. You're very taped up. We have all the allergens on your back. We reinforce it with tape so it doesn't fall off. Here's the thing, during this week, you cannot shower. The reason you cannot shower is because we want those to stay exactly where they are. We don't want the allergens to wash away. We don't want the patches to fall off because then I'm not gonna know where things are. If I don't know where things are, it doesn't help me that you have a positive reaction. I don't know what that was. So you can't shower that week because your back has to stay dry. Some people don't like that, but people usually tell me on Friday it's not as bad as it sounds. On Wednesday, when you come back, my nurse will take off all the patches. So all the patches will come off and they will draw. This is how I know exactly where things were. So if you were allergic to panel number six and one of those specific ones, I have a sheet that tells me what we put there and what, and what it is exactly. So if you're allergic to that, I can tell you what you're allergic to, what it is, and how it's relevant to your dermatitis, or if it's not relevant to your dermatitis. So this is what happens on Wednesday. All the stickies come off. You still can't shower because I don't want you to wash away all the markers. And then finally on Friday, on Friday, what happens is we're looking for those red welts. So when we see those red welts, we know that you have a positive reaction and we can tell you what that positive reaction is. Once we know what you're allergic to, people then ask me, do I have to go through all my products at home and look through the ingredients and say it doesn't have X, Y, or Z? You can, but you don't have to because the American Contact Dermatitis Society developed a program 
called the Contact Allergen Management Program, or CAM. This program is available online. This program is also available on your smartphone. And what this program does is it takes everything you're allergic to, plugs it into a database of roughly 6,000 products, sorts through those products, and gives you a list of everything that doesn't contain what you're allergic to and the related substances, and will give you everything that is safe for you to use on your skin. Categories include conditioners, shampoos, hair dyes, hair treatments, nail care products, foot care products, moisturizers, it really is a very exhaustive list of products. And it has helped a lot of patients figure out what is safe for them to use, clear up their rash, then they can go back and try to use some of their personal things that they really like using that they're not allergic to just to see if it's safe for them or not. On this program, it also has information sheets that's available for you. So I have a sample of a formaldehyde. It tells you what it is, other names it goes by, where you can find it, and how you're gonna go ahead and avoid it. Each patient gets one of these sheets at the end of their evaluation, depending on what they're allergic to. This is what the um, program looks like. On the left, you get a, um, you, it generates a series of codes for you. On the top corner, you can see search code one and search code two. Those are specific to the patient after we generate the database, so that no two databases are the same. It lists everything that they were allergic to, and then on the right is a photo of the app. And what the app does is that not only does it tell you what you're allergic to, it tells you what's safe for you on your smartphone. So you can take your phone with you to the store and then you can say under hair care, I wanna find a conditioner that is safe for me. It'll tell you specifically which ones to look for. And then here, for example, are different detergents and different cleaners. And you can see those are the ones that are safe for this patient. Seventh generation disinfecting wipes are safe for this patient. Seventh generation stainless steel cleaner. It goes through a lot of different products to make sure that these do not contain what you're allergic to and they are what's safe for you to use. So patients really like this because it's pretty personalized. And this database gets um, updated every three months or so. And then usually for most of these patients, if we can find something that they're allergic to and we can get them to avoid it, it takes about one or three months for the allergen to kind of work itself out of your environment as well as your system. And then most of them tend to improve pretty significantly if we find the right allergen. Right. So to conclude here, allergic contact dermatitis is both common and frequent cause of different types of rashes. We just don't often think about it. Allergens may be hidden in a lot of different things, things for babies, things that are organic, things that are all natural. It doesn't mean that they are allergen free. And then patch testing is definitely the gold standard in terms of evaluating what is your allergen and getting you to avoid this allergen. Thank you very much. Yes? Do you know if formaldehyde is in clothing or sunscreen resistant? Um, no, so each clothing item that is sunscreen resistant contains something called the um, ultraviolet protection factor or UPF, um, but it, that doesn't have any bearing on whether or not it contains formaldehyde. It actually has more to do with the type of weave that goes into the clothing to protect itself from the sun. So if you have a button down shirt that says it has a uniform protection factor, but it's made out of permanent um, press or wrinkle resistant material, it can have both. But if you have a clothing that is fully, very wrinkled looking and has UPF in it, then it probably does not contain formaldehyde in it. But you can't be sure, you have to look. And after repeated washings, yeah. does the sunscreen protection go away? It does. So some clothing after repeated washing, because of wear and tear on the fabric itself, the weave is no longer as tight and the UPF will go down. Um, and that's a great question about formaldehyde too, because sometimes people think if I bought clothing that has formaldehyde in it and I wash it a few times, the levels do go down, but not enough if you are sensitized to the formaldehyde already. So it can still cause rashes. So sometimes we tell people, if you have to wear this, like a uniform for work, wear an undershirt that's 100% cotton and very wrinkly, like a Hanes undershirt, doesn't have contain formaldehyde, it'll protect you for a little bit of time, but not completely. Yes? How about if you are allergic to neosporin yeah. or the cut? Yeah. What should yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there is a prescription antibiotic that right now still has a very low rate of allergic contact dermatitis. It's called Mupirocin, M-U-P-I-R-O-C-I-N. It is a prescription product. Um, and right now, it, and probably because it's not as commonly used, there's still a low rate of allergic reaction to it. Um, but that is usually what I tell my patients. If you can't use Neosporin, use this instead, and I'll give you a prescription, and, and, I'll, and I'll provide them a prescription for it. So I have a few questions from the yes. audience. Where can you get the nickel testing kit, nickel alert? Yeah, so you can find it on Amazon. Go to Amazon and say nickel test and you'll find it. 
And this question is regarding a rash. How can you tell whether to use a strong hydrocortisone cream or a fungal cream? Um, so if it is allergic contact dermatitis, a topical steroid cream is what is going to be most effective because we're talking about an inflammatory reaction and steroids shut down inflammatory reactions. Um, a fungal cream would be helpful if we're dealing with you know, athlete's feet, um, fungal infection on the skin, ringworm, things like that, but it wouldn't be very effective for allergic contact dermatitis if that's what it is. What bed sheets would be safe to use? Only cotton? So there is a website called eczemaclothing.com or cottonique, I-Q-U-E.com, that sells bed sheets that are from all the high free, and they'll sell clothing that's from all the high free. So that's usually where I direct patients to go. Can you say that term? Cottonique, so C-O-T-T-O-N-I-Q-U-E.com or eczemaclothing.com, so E C O T T O N I Q U E. I Q U E. Yeah, dot com, and they'll have from all the high free bed sheets. If you're not allergic to formaldehyde, there's really not a lot of reason to avoid a lot of these things just because um, it's ubiquitous and probably more expensive to find some of these bed sheets and maybe not the kind that you really like. But if you are allergic to it, this is where I direct a lot of my patients. I think one of your slides you yeah. covered homemade slime and yes. allergy to MI. Yes. Is that different than, because I remember like in the news them covering people making slime, is it borax? Borax, is yeah. Is that same or is that different? Different. So MI is a preservative that is in a lot of different type of household goods, dishwashing soap, shampoos, things like that. Borax is a type of substance they put into slime and it's a strong irritant. So irritant and allergic are two very different things. If you stick your hand in a vat of some sort of a caustic oil, you're gonna get a rash on your hands, but that's not because you're allergic to it, that's just because it's very irritating. Just like you put your hand through a vat of acetone, you're gonna get a rash to it, probably because it's irritating, not allergic. MI is something that causes a true allergy. Borax causes a lot of chemical burns and it causes a lot of irritation on your hands. So sometimes they get better just by avoiding slime, maybe not because of an MI allergy, probably because of borax irritation. So it could be one or the other. Very common. Yes? Um, you mentioned eczema a few times. Yep. Do you often see with a lot of patients who have a history of eczema or sensitive yeah. skin develop yeah. reactions later on? Yeah, that's a great question. So people used to think allergic contact dermatitis and eczema don't coexist together because they, are, they work differently through the immune system. More and more we, we realize kids with eczema are actually more prone to developing allergic contact dermatitis purely because eczema is where you have a deficiency in the barrier in your skin. So if you imagine a brick wall and it has holes in it, that's what your skin with eczema looks like. The things you put on your skin penetrate the skin more easily, your cells are gonna pick up on it more quickly, and then you are more likely to develop an allergic reaction to certain things. So I definitely believe they coexist, and I definitely believe that the more things you use on your skin if you have eczema, the more likely you are to develop allergic contact dermatitis. Absolutely. How about that? You, you wipe uh how about those gels that you yep, use washing the soap? Yeah. You, you said they have a lot of alcohol. It can, can make your skin bad too. It can cause a lot of irritation, yes. But a lot of those hand sanitizers contain fragrances actually. So they actually smell good. So people can become allergic to the fragrances in them. Alcohol itself is not an allergen. Alcohol is more of an irritant. Yes. Well, this was a great talk, first Thanks. of all. If there is a product that has an allergen that is listed really low in the ingredients yeah. up there to the bottom, does yeah. it still need to be avoided? Yes. If okay. you truly have an allergic reaction and you are actually allergic to that chemical, we definitely have you avoid all of it. Just because we don't know, just because it's listed lower, I don't know what the concentration of that allergen is in this product. It certainly depends on how long it sits on your skin. So something that is a rinse off, like a shampoo, probably less likely to cause an issue because you're leaving it on for five minutes before you rinse it off. Versus say a night cream where you're putting it on your face and you're sleeping in it and you're not wiping it off, that's more likely to cause an allergic reaction. But if you truly have an allergic reaction and you're allergic to that chemical, definitely strict, strict, strict avoidance until you get better. And then you're like, I really love this $500 cream that I bought, but it has it on the very bottom of the list. Try it. Sure, but try it on a small part of your body first, like on a part of your wrist or something, and see if you develop a rash before putting it all over your body again. Yeah, absolutely. Yes? Was it, what, isn't there a 
another uh, preservative that begins with an M that is in a lot of products? There is. So it's called methylchloroisothiazolinone. So it's abbreviated MCI. And that's different from MI. So, so I didn't go into the backstory of it, but the backstory is that 20, 30 years ago, people used to use, or cosmetic companies, combined MCI and MI together, called methylchloroisothiazolinone slash methylisothiazolinone. And they were used together as a preservative in products, okay? So MCI, MI. And then about 10, 15 years ago, a lot of reports came out of people who have MCI, MI allergy. And they thought it was all due to the MCI component. So they started to remove the MCI component, jack up the MI components, and that is why you see a lot more MI allergy nowadays because they didn't realize the MI part is just as bad as the MCI part. But you're right, there is. So if you look at some shampoos, it will, it will still list both MCI and MI, but a lot of products will list just MI on its own. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, but now we've seen that MCI allergy actually start to fall because people are using it less. When I was younger, when I was a teenager in high school, they didn't realize, but um, it wasn't until several years down, many years down the road. Um, I actually must have had uh, an allergy to parabens way back then. Okay. So I would have problems with, you know, um, the products that I was putting on my skin. Yeah. But they didn't know that. Yeah. And so uh, I wasn't, I wasn't tested. And so then, um, what ultimately happened was, um, I had started having severe reactions. So then. I was tested like in the early 90s and they thought I had the power of an allergy, mm -hmm. but you know, other allergies, okay, to nickel and various things. Yep. But then um, what happened was, so I eliminated the parabens and anything, you know, that I was putting on my skin or coming in contact with. But then I developed a severe allergy problem to uh, dodacil or borrowed gallop, okay. you know, preservative. Yep. And um, I found out that. Um, there was a connection between the, par I had a paraben and a tannic, um, tannin allergy, and those two allergies from way back in the early 90s, um, can, the patient can go on to develop the dodecyl laurel gallic allergy. And, but I, I had um, severe, severe reactions. I had to go to the emergency room on a few wow. occasions. And so then, you know, I had to be extremely killed. Yeah. Because I was having multiple symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's tough, especially if you don't know what allergic, you know, what you're allergic to. People can go on for years or decades suffering with some sort of an itchy rash and they just have to go through hundreds of products trying to figure out what causes a reaction and what doesn't. It can be very expensive if we don't figure out what it is. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Yes. I go to the, the Y twice a week to do what they call water aerobics. Uh-huh. And when we go to the deep end of the pool, to keep you afloat, they'll use under your arms. They'll use like the noodles or yep. the uh, styrofoam weights yep. or even those kickboards. Yep. But then at the end of the, you know, if they throw them all in a in a pile and then they use by multiple people. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I've had some issues like under the arms because you know, I think it, you know it might come from you know from those you know multiple use items that yep. you know they just get thrown in a pile and the next class comes in and uses them. Yeah. So when people are suspicious of you know, some sort of an item that they're using, we can actually test you directly to that item. So what we'll do is actually, if we get a sample of that noodle, we can take a little piece of that noodle and we can you know, maybe put it in some water, maybe try to mimic some sort of pool water or maybe just put it in plain water. We'll kind of just saturate the noodle and then we'll stick it on your back and then we will see if you actually get an allergic reaction to that. So that's something that we can definitely do in the clinic. People will bring in parts of their car that they think they're allergic to, like a piece of their seat or a piece of their steering wheel. We'll take pieces of people's clothing and We'll stick it on their, you know, on their body as well. We can certainly test for things like that. Other reasons why people can get rashes under the underarms from these products too is there's a lot of rubbing that happens with the noodle in the underarm. It's a relatively sensitive area, so I wonder about, you know, friction. I wonder about rubbing and things like that that can certainly cause a rash there too. But certainly, if you're concerned for an allergic reaction, testing to it would be the easiest way to figure out if it is or if it isn't. Yeah. Uh, like the potpourri, you know, most dry. Yeah, fragrance. Yeah, yeah oh, fragrance. Absolutely fragrance. Heavily fragrance. Incense sticks, Febreze, bathroom cleansers, whatever it is. Heavily fragrance, sprays in the air, you can get a rash to it if you're allergic to fragrances. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very hard to figure out where fragrances are because it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So actually, like the, when you peel the grapefruit or the orange, it smells good. They are yeah. not allergic. <laughs> 
So that's a little bit different. So when you peel oranges and grapefruits, um, the peels themselves actually contain some sort of, actually can be used to derive essential oils from. There's something called limonene, which is an essential oil that actually comes from the peel of citrus fruits. The name itself suggests that it's kind of a lemony kind of sense, a limonene, um, and they can actually extract it. So we have people who are allergic to limonene who eat lemons or lemon products like lemon pie, whatever it is with a little bit of lemon in it, no problem. But if they come in contact with the peel of lemons or the peel of citrus fruits and they get some of that oil on their skin, then they will develop a rash to it. So a little bit different, but yeah, but, you, but that, definitely a possibility. Not something that is common, but a possibility. All right, thank you so Great. much. Absolutely.